for staying behind. Um, it's always great to come out and get a chance to chat with uh, the audience. Um, uh, if you're wondering what this camera is doing here, we're just recording. Uh, you know, we have a very interactive and very uh, sophisticated website, so we're recording uh, some of the uh, Q&A sessions and Bob Kingston's lecture beforehand so that they can be included on our website. Um, so don't pay any attention to this camera. That's actually more for myself than I think for any of you. Um, what can I say about this? Uh, um, this experience of producing uh, this opera, this production. Um, this has been uh, a very full month. Um, it's obviously a very grand opera, large cast, large orchestra, um, large chorus. Uh, this piece is really um, Puccini at the absolute height of his powers. He died before he finished this. Uh, there's um, some articles in the uh, in the in both my letter and in, uh, in the program, Alexis Hamilton's article, it's just, you know, he died in uh, 1924 and the opera premiered in 1926. And um, so it's always interesting to hear this work again because you, you really do hear Puccini exploring all kinds of new areas uh, of, in terms of his musical language. Um, you know, by, by the time he composed the Turandot already, the Rite of Spring being composed by Stravinsky, and the music of Debussy with Pelias and Melisande, the music of Ravel. All of this uh, Puccini was absorbing, and thus you have um, the use of the orchestra in this opera is, is particularly colorful and evocative and, and quite modern. Um, you know, I, uh, there was quite a bit of dissonance in this piece, but nonetheless, it's always Puccini, and uh, it's got that wonderful sort of Puccini sound, which I, don't know, I, always, I always have a hard time describing. You, could always, you always know when you hear a Puccini melody because it's so uniquely his, uh, his color, his yearning, his, that, sort of, that sort of plaintive quality you know, to his music that is so emotionally direct that um, people can't get enough of Puccini. And certainly, turned up has become um, right up there with Man and Butterfly and La Boheme and Tosca. I'd say the past 25 years, it's, it's sort of up there now with those big three as such a popular opera, and certainly the most popular opera composer with, uh, with the general public. So I've asked a couple of artists to come out and join me once they get out of a, a, a costume and makeup, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the opera itself or the production or anything else that might be on your mind. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Sure. So the question was, uh, can I talk about the meaning of the production, the staging, and, and specifically the portraits at the end, uh, which uh, the gentleman feels contradicted, um, what, the sort of celebratory music at the end? Um, you know, I always say I never tell an audience what to think uh, of a production or, what, or, or how to interpret something, because I always learn much more. From, from hearing what audience members take away from a production than, than, than anything else. Uh, I've been living with this production for a while. Um, I know Christopher Alden, who directed it, he made the choice. Uh, Chris Alden did our Flying Dutchman a few years ago. Rather highly regarded American director, directs all over the world. Um, clearly, it's not a traditional production of Toronto. That, that's, that's apparent. <laughs> those, that are, those that are familiar with, with more traditional productions of Toronto. Um, Often you'll see in a more traditional production, I know for instance in the Metropolitan Opera production, the curtain goes out, and there are a series of severed heads on poles, you know, heads of the heads of the princess that have been beheaded. You know, you'll see that sometimes. Um, this was, uh, I think, a choice he and the designer made, that that would be the first statement when the curtain goes out, as you see all those photographs of all the men that have lost their lives in, in their pursuit of this, of this princess, Turandot. And I, my, what I get from it, and I have no idea if this, if this was his intent, was that when the chorus then re-enters with those heads, those photographs at the end, and sort of comes downstage, that, that perhaps he's suggesting a little closure, that now the, this reign of terror is over, and now let's celebrate the fact that there'll be no further bloodshed with these, with these riddles because love has won the day. That might be a very superficial interpretation of, of what he's suggesting there, but that would be something that I would guess he was thinking. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Did anyone else want to, you know, did anyone else get any, an impression as to what those photographs were all about? Yes, sir.
Yes. Yes. Well, but the heads come down after she says, uh, you know, that I know his name, his name is love. Uh, and then the heads come down after that. Uh, so, I, you know, that's just my guess. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. <laughs> they all look like murderers, those headshots. Yeah. Well, I guess they were just sort of, uh, well, you know, that was a, yeah, I guess you said they look like mugshots. Speaking of wonderful, yes, yeah, so will you please welcome our tour guide? Now, Laurie sang with us last in uh, Fidelio two seasons ago, the role of Leonora. So uh, it's, it's really wonderful to have her back on our stage here at, at Portland Opera. Um, before I ask uh, Laurie a question or turn it over to you, were there any, any other, I saw a few other hands go up in, in relation to these photos. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I have a question for you, and then I would like to ask Laurie her reaction to this. Yeah. How severely is the stage rate? Um, the question is, how severely is the stage rate? By rate, that means the tilt that, that the design is. And it's a fairly severe rate. Um, it's about four feet down. Don't know. I don't know where Lori is. Uh, Lori, L Laura, our, our production director. But it's a fairly, how does this rate, uh, how does this rate uh, feel to you, Lori? Oh, to actually, rates? not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, this <laughs> is a fairly mild rate compared to. Com compared to some, which are very steep, this yeah. isn't too bad at all. Yeah. So you don't feel that it's difficult to work? Well, there were a couple of times when all that slow crossing I have to do, I'm afraid, with, I had heels on and everything. I'm um, thinking, gosh, golly, I did have to get used to that. Um, I'm a little afraid that I, I might tilt the wrong way. <laughs> you know. But uh, in, but re realistically, I think these are things that we just handle, of course, as performers and go with it. It's really not as bad as some the rig. Do you feel that that affects your performance at all? No, no, not at all. I mean, it, it's kind of built in. Actually, I think it's all part of Chris Alden's grand scheme because really it makes uh, makes the touring you know feel a little uncomfortable. Which she is. She's kind of uncomfortable in her own skin in this piece, you know, in this in this production. She's very, very, um, you know, sort of like uh, uh, trying to find a new, a new home, shedding one skin and trying to put, you know, find find herself as you know a butterfly now instead of the in a cocoon. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's the way we had talked about it, and the production kind of lends itself to that, and all that slight awkwardness is, I just think is built in. Mm -hmm. Probably intentionally. <laughs> oh no. Okay, uh, the lady asked, is touring that always blonde? <laughs> no, I, admit, uh, I don't usually see her blonde at all. Uh, this is the first time. Uh, I've done her blonde, and I've been I've been doing the role now for a few years. <laughs> and um, no, never not usually blonde. It's all like this is part of a concept. Um, I mean, if you imagine um, a '30s heroine from like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, that's kind of what I was trying to portray. Once I saw the blonde wig, I thought, well, this is kind of cool. It's different. So I was going with that. I was kind of always thinking Kim Novak in Vertigo. <laughs> you know, that sort of mysterious tormented woman, you know. 